Welcome to the Steam Smart Podcast, the podcast that's all about Steam, the blockchain-based social media platform that's taking over the world. I'm here with Gabriel Shear at Pied Piper. Hey there, just back from traveling, ready to rock. And Steven Polsky at Sneaky Squirrel. Hey guys, I've, I am super excited for this episode. And I'm George Donnelly. At George Donnelly. Today, our topic is how to create a following on Steemit. And we're here with Sterling Lujan at Sterling Lujan, an all around very interesting person, the psychologic anarchist, a writer, researcher, and Zen master. <laughs> how are you doing today, Sterling? I am doing excellent, George. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, great. Yeah, don't call me sir, though. <laughs> I'm not that old yet. I mean, I'm getting up there. He works for a living. <laughs> so, the episode with Sterling. So, um, yeah, so uh, Sterling, I think our, our topic, you know, for the first part is just, uh, you know, you have a huge following on Steemit. You have, uh, you're closing in on a thousand followers. Um how did you do it? <laughs> well, and, and I think that other people have stated this before, but I think a, the, the, the largest factor in my following is the fact that I already had a large following before I came to Steemit, before I discovered Steemit. I'd been working the last five or six years writing constantly, creating Facebook posts, creating different kinds of content. And so what happened when Steemit came, came along, I jumped on, of course, signed up, and I think probably a good portion of those followers are people who already followed me and possibly a lot of new sign-ons is a good part of how that occurred. Then of course, I guess the more practical aspect of it is just producing a lot of content and producing a lot of consistent content has also led people to find me and to follow me as well. So that's a, a good part of it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but what, uh, what advice, what advice do you have? You know, I'm a complete noob. I just signed up. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the whales have stacked the deck against me. Um, I'm not an interesting person in my opinion. Um, and, um, I'm feeling some negative emotions, <laughs> but I really want to have success on Steam because I think it's cool. I think it's awesome. What is, what is my next step, Sterling? Well, I think you've already sort of kicked your next step into gear by starting this podcast that you have, which I, when I first saw it, I thought... No, no but I mean like a, for a noob, not, not for me. I mean, I, I do appreciate the... <laughs> that was the a, that was a good first person. Okay, okay. Uh, hi hypothetical, right? Yeah, okay. you know, you're, you're a random yeah. new Steemit user. Right, okay. What I would recommend is the consistency in writing a lot and producing a lot of content is super important, but then that, that is not all that matters. I think also there's an, there's a degree of marketing that anybody who wants to get known on social media, on the internet in general, they have to put themselves out there. They have to be personal. They have to talk about their own experiences and then they have to get on different communities, uh, whether it's groups on Facebook, wh whether it's making posts on Reddit, and they have to share that material everywhere. Just because you produce content doesn't mean that, it's, that someone's going to see it. You have to be willing to put it out there. You have to be willing to put yourself on the line. And that's how I've always really approached it. I haven't, I, I've had enough gumption and enough wherewithal to put my content online, regardless if it's about me personally, and regardless if it's, a, if it's controversial material, and allowed that to people to try to soak up that material. And I think because of that, authenticity. That's the term I want to use to describe what I do. You have to be an authentic and genuine individual. Put that stuff out there and people will find you. So first it's about sort of finding your audience through networking online and using the different social media platforms. And then that's when pe your, your followers will naturally come to you. You'll naturally build a community. And that brings me to the next point. I think whatever you're doing online, one of my key focuses ha has been actually community building, building this compassionate anarchist community building this idea that uh, we should use empathy we should use our human relations our deep connections with each other and i think that's really resonated with a lot of people and that's what's put me on the in, in the spotlight i think especially in the last year or two 
just t taking this this more emotional, this more deeply humane connection, and really spreading that that the gospel of that outward. I see. Okay, so well said. you gotta you gotta so Sterling's advice you gotta you gotta find something to write about, or otherwise create content about. You've got to do it on a regular schedule, and then you got to go out and and find people who are interested in it. That's right. So what about the person who says, um, I don't know what to write about? Right. The, the first, this came to mind before you even asked that question, but anybody who's going to do any type of writing, you always, the, the, the northern star of writing to me is to write what you know. Write whatever areas that you love to read about. Write about your life because obviously you're going to know that better then you're going to know about anything else. So write about your life, write about the subjects and the topics that you're deeply impassioned by. Love it. Don't, one of the things that I, don't be nervous about writing. I know it can be difficult as far as, you know, dealing with writer's block and those kind of things, but you have to be able to just push through, just write, let the, let the, uh, let your unconscious and subconscious mind do the creative work for you and then go back and do the, the editing after the fact. If you're constantly worried about what you're writing, you'll never get it done. You've got to just go, go out there and you've got to push out the material. Mm -hmm. what, what about if I, I'm, I'm not interesting though? What if I have, I'm not really interested in anything. Maybe I'm looking for a topic that uh, is profitable or, or predisposed to earning me the kind of following that you have. Yeah, what do I do then? How do I search within myself or my world around me to find something? You know, what, 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 what do I do there? Yeah, I think this is definitely a psychological issue. I think individuals who already have a negative outlook on themselves and have self-esteem issues are already shooting themselves in the foot before they've even started typing on the keyboard or trying to put material out there. I, I think there's, there definitely needs to be some introspection. People need to really look deeply at themselves and what they're interested in before they even try to you know, take it to that next step, get on there and start writing content. So I would recommend doing anything from really trying to discover what your passions are, what you're doing, you know, outside of the scope of the internet and trying to hone in on that. I think that's really super important in working on the, the, the self-esteem and the negativity, because first of all, people don't, people don't gravitate toward negative Nancy's, right? If you're negative all the time anyway, or you have this this feeling or this mentality that your material is not worthless or any good, that's not a motivator, first of all, to do any type of work and to go out there and find the audience. So a person's really got to discover what they're about, what, what their, their direction in life is, have some sort of trajectory that's going to really build the, the persona up. I think that's super important. So maybe therapy or counseling could help, self-help books could help, just some introspection. There, there's a lot of different ways to try to discover that. I I've always been interested in the use of psychedelic compounds. So yeah. like mushrooms, which is a compound of psilocybin, LSD, those type of compounds really help with the inner search and discovering really and truly who you are. And that's always helped me. I was particularly interested and fascinated by MDMA. And that was the compound that really got me thinking and sort of bootstrapped me to this lifestyle immediately. Okay, so newbies, there you have your answer. Take mushrooms and NDMA. <laughs> no, and all that actually happened from there. Yeah, no, nah, you got it. Set and setting <laughs> is super important in regards to using psychedelics for introspective tools. They're really, really powerful. They've been discussed in a clinical setting for a very long time. It's not it's not blasted by the media. That's not in their interest to have people who are psychologically healthy. Uh, if they know how to solve their own problems, why would they go to a doctor or, you know, why would they go to a psych uh, psychiatrist? Um, so, no, there's a, there's a great benefit I've personally found. Um, and I've witnessed countless times from others that um, it, it does a lot for the individual to actually, um, have that sense of confidence and that introspection provided by those by those uh, chemicals really really blast you off even even one time that um, that one time drastically stretches your uh, previous experiences um, because you know you have that elastic 
experience bubble that once it's once it's stretched you can't go back to the original dimensions so it, it really changes you and statistically for the better i mean you go look at the people who've done it provided they don't you know get absurdly addicted to that serotonin and dopamine um release from those compounds and just waste their life and so in very few cases break themselves but if you if you actually use them properly they they launch people uh i mean the overused bill gates steve jobs um and a whole slew of other very very prominent individuals in business owe their um owe a lot of their uh, power that they somehow gathered. They owe that to the introspection provided by psychedelics. And another little fun fact, uh, uh, Silicon Valley is actually utilizing psychedelics as well for creative work. They're microdosing acid. Um, that's a really interesting development that occurred in the last two years. So it's another additional tool that psychedelics provide. But enough of that rant. <laughs> All right, so you two guys who are uh, experts on psychedelics, because I don't, I, I don't really use drugs. I barely drink alcohol. Uh, I, uh, what's one insight, one specific insight into um, who you are, what you want to be about, what you're passionate about that you have gained from using uh, psychedelic substances? Um, you get this sense of objectivity. This, this. No, but give me one specific thing that you learned. I'm, I'm re- that you're passionate into, about. Yeah. Leading into that, so the sense of objectivity really shows. And when you're kind, you're you're really, really, really kind, and you're really happy because of all those additional um, neurochemicals that are going on and flooding your brain. Um, and then you witness that you're being kind and a lot of good things are happening to you right now, but you're seeing it objectively. Um, And then you realize, oh snap, if I just do that without being on psychedelics, the same thing happens. So you get this sense of um, connection with other people to immediately be kind, to take the leap forward and provide kindness and value in the form of friendship ahead of time, rather than waiting for something um, and that was something that for me was big for psychedelics, um, recognizing that just sense of connection, I suppose. I mean, it's, it's the overplayed bit, um, but it, it means that you don't need to have enemies. So for me, it was like, why are problems even a thing? Why do people convince themselves to have problems? And from there, you just see the world through a lens of problems are just problems are the problem so how do you fix that you stop having problems you stop viewing the world looking for problems um that was kind of it for me do you, do you want to answer that sterling yeah sure. what, what specific what uh, what name one specific insight into something that helped that came from psychedelic substance use that helps you identify what you're passionate about yeah absolutely When I first got into psychedelics, it wasn't, you know, technically a psychedelic because MDMA has been referred to as an entactogen and an empathogen. But upon testing out that substance, the main insight that I had on the peak experience was this idea that I'm a lot smarter than I ever knew or thought that I was. As I peaked on the compound, I had the realization or the epiphany that I had always been told that maybe I wasn't too intelligent or that I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do in life. And I think this was primarily as a result of my experiences in the public education system because I was diagnosed with ADD early on and I was fed the amphetamine compound, methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin. And I was put into remedial classes and I failed the third grade. So I had a lot of difficulty, quote unquote, in the public education system, but What MDMA taught me later on in life was that I am a lot more intelligent than I was told. I am a lot more creative. I am an actual person, a human being who can achieve things. And that that to me was the biggest, most important insight that that I had in my life on MDMA. It's because these institutions for 
children who are who are different or who want to think outside the box or who don't want to follow the arbitrary dictates of the institutional insect lords they th this is the compound that gets you out of that mindset and brings you into the fold of what it means to be a fucking human being and that was my the, the greatest experience from that and Ever since that, I, you know, I went down the road of anarchism, trying out all the different psychedelics and actually living, actually enjoying this existence in the now. What's what Terrence McKenna referred to as the felt presence of immediate experience. And that's really what I was involved in, what, I, what, what put me on this path that I'm on right now. And that, that's the insight. And that's why these are recommended. But like Stephen said, you really do got to pay attention to what Timothy Leary called set and setting. You've got to do this stuff with the proper mindset, with the proper environment, and with the proper people around. You know, if you're out at a party where a bunch of people are drunk and acting like barbarians, <laughs> you're probably going to have a bad time. So that would not be recommended. All right. All right. Gabriel, do you have any thoughts on, on psychedelics or on, you know, creating a following? I think this just kind of plays into the old adage, um, right drunk, edit sober. <laughs> and... <laughs> That when you write drunk, that doesn't have to mean that you're drunk on alcohol. It's just an elevated, stimulated, motivated state of mind that can be triggered with drugs. It can be triggered by having great friends around and having a party. And I've actually got a friend right here and we're writing screenplays and concepts for films and things like that. And in that process, when you want to like get the ideas flowing and stuff like that, I mean, there's no substitute to just getting around a table and just flowing, just spitting ideas, laughing at your own stupidity, take notes of every dumb thing that comes out, have fun with it, and then sort it all out later, you know? So I guess you've probably got your own drugs of choice that you've come to use o over the years and whatever works for you, right? I mean, I don't personally use that stuff myself. I have some alcohol once in a while, but... <laughs> I mean, just find that stimulant that gets you out of your rut because especially if you're introverted or, or whatever, you kind of find that comfort zone of just hunkered down, quiet in your own thoughts. And then you get very self-critical and then you get kind of a perfectionism thing going on and you keep questioning yourself and second guessing yourself and then you don't get anything done. So <laughs> that's, that's not useful at all. That can be kind of useful when it's time to clean things up later, but it's so important to just keep the flow going and crank out concepts. Mm, I think so. I think that that's insightful. I have to say, you know, I, Stephen Sterling, I mean, I respect your position, but I have to say, you know, I'm so skeptical of drug use as a gateway to creativity. Um, when I, when I need a boost, I, I get exercise, I get exercise or a hot shower. Um, I don't know. So um, but if it works for you guys, I mean, cool. But uh, yeah, I'm skeptical. No, uh, I, uh, I actually have identified uh, in Myers Briggs. Of course, there are uh, personalities that are more prone to drug use and drug abuse, um, finding themselves in situations just by personality type that, and their curiosity naturally leads them towards these substances. And, you know, they're going to try anything once and then maybe they'll try it a few more times. Like there's, there are predictable personalities that go through this. Um, and also those predictable personalities um, are, are often chaotic and to get into the situations to begin with, to start getting into drugs at all, you're probably not on the best path. So it's an interesting uh, twist of events that certain drugs get you out of that uh, rut, get you onto the right path. Um, so you're building towards an abundance mindset as opposed to a, um, you know, a negative mindset. I, I've seen it happen Plenty of times, um, again, I, as, as people use these and have these introspections, they, they have the same ones. You can have these conversations with people who've used these uh, compounds uh, for the same purposes, and they have the similar stories, and they talk about them in a similar way. So there, it, it's not for everybody. I don't recommend it for everybody. Um, I think that some people lose their shit on psychedelics, um, and I've seen it happen. I've seen people have really bad experiences with any any substance um and i think that has a little bit more to do with their self-discipline while sober 
Um, if you don't have any form of self-discipline while sober, you're certainly not going to have any when you're, uh, you know, you're tripping your face off or if you're, you're rolling your tits off. Um, but if you're, but if, you know, if you already have that self-discipline, you can let it, you can let some of it go and you'll still be exercising more self-discipline than some people are sober. Um, and those are, you know, people who've already done certain, uh, they live a certain type of lifestyle already. So, uh, Sterling, I have a pretty strong uh, suspicion about what your Myers-Briggs type is, but do you, do you know what it is? Hmm. Uh, you know, last time I did it, it was a long time ago, and I know it's probably not accurate now because I've changed from my perspective slightly over the years, but it was, I want to say INTP earlier on. But I doubt that's the same now. Well, I don't know. Your person, the, the test may give you, uh, the results of the test can be put into question, but the, your personality type doesn't really change over time. But uh, I'm pretty sure you're an NF. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking NFJ. But uh, you're pretty definitely an NF. You're definitely an FI user, an introverted feeling user, because you're concerned about authenticity. And that's an FI thing. And right. INTPs are FE users. So, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I think you're probably an, an, an NF, you know. Yeah, you're probably right. But you also have a lot of other developed functions. I don't know how old you are, but you certainly have done a lot of additional growth that puts you outside of the classic models that certain personalities fall into. Um, I would imagine like having a strong NF or FI doesn't prevent you from being um, a, a critical thinker with a, with a strong leading uh, think, extroverted thinking and introverted intuition. So, right. uh, you know, it, it just, it depends kind of what your focus is on and then how you relate that focus towards what you put out to the world and but yes you're you're george identified it you definitely are concerned with your feelings and the feelings of others i think and it's it's very relevant in the or it's very obvious in the tone of your articles and i mean i love the passion um i i definitely can relate to a lot of it i think a lot of your work is very very interesting right so let's jump to the second topic of our podcast which is uh, how do you grow a cause on Steemit? Uh, you know, Sterling, you're, you're part of, uh, you have a cause, uh, psychologic anarchism, and you're part of the greater cause of uh, uh, anarchism, libertarianism, uh, that stuff. So what, what do you think, you know, let's say somebody is coming from uh, an activist group or a nonprofit organization or something, and, and they want to build their cause on Steemit. What, what advice do you have for them? 